Slime the F-35. It is the dream of many young boys and girls and the professional pinnacle for many military pilots. And today is more attainable than ever because the fifth generation fighters have deeply changed the way the pilots train. And this is happening because the tactics and the operations are different. What you read in the history books and you think to know about air operations or air combat maneuvers, well, it's no longer valid. Concepts like the role of the wingman, the alpha strike, the air to ground operations have been superseded by features like stealth and collaborative targeting. The fifth generation air warfare is a revolution. It is indeed, sir. Thank you, Otis. It is as revolutionary as you learning to avoid dumping your dirty laundry on my charging, sir. Uh, dear viewers, just one second. In the meanwhile, intro! This video is kindly sponsored by patrons, channel members and all the other supporters. Every military pilot started as a wingman. The basic unit of air operation is a couple of aircraft, a section with a leader and a wingman. The training and career progression of a fighter pilot often goes through the stages of being a wingman, a two-ship leader and then a four-ship leader, where the four-ship formation is composed by two two-ship sections. Why do aircraft are called ships? Uh, that's because um, I'll, I'll tell you later, okay? There have been examples in history of different organizations, but after World War II, these two or four aircraft structures are widely used everywhere in the world. These two unit cells are the elementary particle of air operations planning. Planners and ground services think in terms of generation of two ship sorties to assemble operations that require eventually dozens of different aircraft operating in coordination. And by the way, this is typical for fighter aircraft, bomba or sport aircraft may operate differently. Well, the rationale behind this formation is rather simple. The leader executes the mission and the wingman protects the leader. This obviously doesn't mean that the wingman never executes anything. This doesn't mean that the firepower is halved in this way. Both aircraft cooperate under the leader direction who takes the key decision and controls the wingman. The wingman is generally not allowed to take autonomous decisions and a good part of its attention goes to the conflicting with the leader, as since they both tend to fly in visual range of each other to yeah, simplify the coordination. Fifth generation air warfare is changing all of this. 4++ and 5th generation aircraft feature data fusion. The picture presented to the pilot is the fusion of data coming from different sensors through a fusion engine. The key point though for the point of view of this video is that these sensors can be located on other aircraft. The data coming in via data link from the other aircraft is treated like a sensor data stream and it is integrated in the pilot's presentation. One of the implications of this approach, for example, is that the individual pilot cannot work freely with its own sensors. If your sensors are used by others, you can't really play around with, for example, the radar search patterns because you will be hindering the capability of the whole formation. With 4++ and 5th generation aircraft there are systems that prioritize tracks and targets for sensor investigation. The aircraft is usually managing the sensor on its own without requiring much intervention from the pilot. Pilots are left with some key decisions to take like to be active, furtive or totally passive or whether using the full wartime modes or stay on peacetime modes but there is no playing around with the sensors anymore. This is obviously a big paradigm shift in itself. The pilot has fewer tasks but more situational awareness at a level that is not even comparable with the previous generations. Gen 4 aircraft do have data links that give them some level of God's view, but the Gen 4 plus plus and to a larger extent the fifth generation are literally built around these features and usually do a much better job from the point of view of the pilot. 
So the pilot doesn't really need a wingman anymore and the wingman must pick up tasks that in the past were not under his or her responsibility. Tactics, for example, For example, when the aircraft is using passive sensing, either optical or electronic, it is difficult to calculate the distance. The fifth generation solves this problem by combining the data from different sensors on different aircraft and then triangulating. It is actually more complicated than this, but the concept is two or more aircraft separated by 20-30 miles can greatly improve the accuracy of passive location by determining the distance. But if the aircraft are separated by miles and generally well beyond visual range, then the wingman is not really a wingman anymore. All the pilots in the formation must stay away from each other and operate with an unprecedented degree of autonomy. The leader is not controlling the wingman anymore. They cooperate. Like I and Mr. Millennium do cooperate for the creation of these videos. Uh, that's a bit... Okay, never mind. This means that they must know how to cooperate and the wingman must have the autonomy and the authority to work autonomously. A wingman flying in a fifth generation aircraft requires a different training than those who fly on fourth generation uh, to be effective and much more of it, but we will come back to this later. What really matters is that the old tactic of having a leader and a wingman right behind is no longer current. A formation of F-35s will be spread over a couple of hundreds of kilometers or, or more. They will be managing their own electronic signature, trying to passively locate threats and providing either information to the larger network to engage them or directly guiding long-range weapons against them. Concentrating the aircraft in a single formation is no longer the way of creating local air superiority, but just a way to give up one of the main advantages of the fifth generation aircraft. <sighs> Stealth is overrated. I genuinely think it is. And he is not the only one. You will see in a future video. Uh, Otis, please. Don't give away nuggets like this, okay? That wasn't a nugget, sir. Give me strength. Which is not the same as saying that stealth is useless or obsolete. It is one of the capabilities that a modern combat aircraft must have to be survivable and effective in a modern combat environment. Particularly if near peer opponents are involved and the fight is symmetrical. However, the adoption of low observable technologies has heavily influenced the tactics of combat aircraft. Delaying the detection is an old concept. All the low flying tactics developed before the advent of stealth are, in fact, a surrogate of stealth. And the purpose of flying low is to exploit the highly controversial fact that the heart is round. Radar propagation cannot follow the curvature of the heart, creating what is usually called a radar horizon, which geometrically determines the maximum distance at which an aircraft could be seen. Bantines and other ground reliefs may create radar shadows that a competent planner and a capable pilot can exploit to delay being identified. The reflective radiation depends on the aspect of the aircraft. For every aircraft, actually every object, we can create a polar diagram representing the specific amount of reflected energy if illuminated under that specific aspect. Typically, an aircraft seen from the front is less visible by radars than seen from the side. And more relevantly, an aircraft seen from below reflects more radiation than from the side. So, when an aircraft banks to turn, the underside is exposed to radar radiation and it causes a higher radar return. F-117 pilots were told not to evade a guided missile in case they were fired upon because stealth was considered a better protection than evasion and remaining low observable was deemed more important than trying to kinematically beat the missile. I believe you need nerves of steel to react like this.
The origin of the DAS feature on the F-35 is in fact rooted in the idea that the pilot had to minimize the banking and the maneuvers in general. The DAS is an augmented reality system that shows a picture taken by a group of infrared cameras on the pilot visor and it allows the pilot to look in every direction as if the aircraft structure wasn't there. The system is considered extremely useful and it is an important element of the pilot situational awareness but it also allows the pilot to look around without maneuvering the aircraft keeping it in the best stealth attitude. Tactics have changed also in air-to-ground operations. In fact, an air-to-ground penetration mission against a developed air defense has two options. Either avoid detection or just throw down the door. These are the same options that a four-generation aircraft has, but the execution is completely different. A four-generation strike package will fly very close to ground, trying to mask its presence with terrain features and hide under the radar horizon as long as possible. However, as soon as the masking is not available, the package becomes visible on the air defense's radar screens, thus becoming vulnerable. Moreover, flying at such low altitudes is quite inefficient and dangerous. A fifth generation strike package will use its stealth, which reduces the detection range of radar systems, to infiltrate through the gaps that are opened by the reduced range and then hit the target. It doesn't need to use ground coverage, albeit it may be useful in some specific cases. You understand that even the most complex time on target mission is simplified by the fact that fifth generation has much more freedom of maneuvering undetected and interconnection through data links allow for a much better coordination. The other option is an offensive mission where the strike package suppresses or destroys the air defenses, opening the way for other aircraft to hit the target. In this case, the fifth generation aircraft will lead the package using its ability to get close to the air defenses, target them passively without emitting radiation, and either using its own weapons or using other aircraft long range weapons to hit or suppress the air defenses. In this way, other aircraft will be able to enter the gap and hit the target. In both cases, low observability, passive sensing and discrete communication greatly simplify the task and increase the overall effectiveness. And what is the lowest common denominator of all these tactics? It is the concept of managing the aircraft electromagnetic signature. A fifth generation aircraft can do, well, a lot of things remaining completely passive with low probability of being intercepted or it could go full blast using the radar and the electronic warfare at the top of their capabilities. These are options that are not available to previous generation aircraft, which means that there are simply more ways for a fifth generation aircraft to execute a mission, which means that the opponent's defenses need to be wary of all the different options, which means that the tactical or operational surprise is much more easily achievable with the fifth generation aircraft. And I think I don't need to remind you how surprise is the force multiplier everyone wants to achieve. And the fifth generation air warfare has a massive impact on air-to-air -air combat. If tactical surprise is important in air-to-ground, it is fundamental in air-to-air. Being in the position of firing without being detected is the single most important factor determining the outcome of air-to-air -air combat. We are used to think to the classic dogfight because it is fascinating in itself, but ending up in such a situation is actually a loss for the attacker. The attacker wants to approach the target unseen, fire and go away. In this context, laying the identification is a very important advantage. In an environment rich of weapons with BVR capabilities, firing first is a decisive advantage and it often results in a kill. Firing first gives the option to optimize the weapon kinematics, improving the kill probability. Ideally, you may want that the aircraft is in a position to fire from within the weapon's nest while still being undetectable. 
However, it is to be noticed that the weapon launch in itself may give away the stealth aircraft position since, well, the weapon may not be stealth and the launch may generate a large infrared plume. Moreover, the necessity of not generating visible contrails may impose some limitations to the usable flight levels, albeit these are usually not that relevant. The multi-ship sensor fusion via discrete data link communication is also very useful in air-to-air -air engagements. In fact, command and control are much simplified since every member of the flight has full knowledge of the tactical situation as depicted by all the sensors available in the area and connected to the data link network. Complex orders may be communicated via discrete data link without requiring voice explanations. In the first flag level exercises where the F-22 and the F-35 were involved, they demonstrated these capabilities. Some ridiculous numbers appeared in the press like 70 to 1 in terms of kill ratios in favor of the fifth gen aircraft. While well, they, yeah, they are what they are. Now with everyone aware of the tactics and the performance of these aircraft, the advantage has reduced, but still the fifth generation, everything else equal, is much more effective than the previous generations. For example, against a first generation aircraft, the fifth gen doesn't need to defend itself in the same way as they used to because even when fired upon, stealth protects from radar guided missiles as well. It may not even be necessary to go defensive after firing since the opponent can't see or track the shooter. And this is a big advantage in air combat. I have to say though that I did not hear anything about what happens when the opponent is fifth generation as well. Some F-35s of the earlier blocks that couldn't be updated are now used as aggressors. And the scenario that has opened when we have fifth gen against fifth gen, well, is definitely, definitely intriguing to say the least, but very little information is available. So I'm sorry, but I think we will have to leave this for another time. So, it may seem incredible for us engineers, but pilots don't like knobs and switches. For a very long time, knobology was a study subject for every military pilot transitioning to a new aircraft model. This began to change with the Generation 4 and 4++ plus plus aircraft, and it changed quite radically with the fifth generation. But this is not the only thing that changed. If anything, it may be the less important. There are other elements that make a fifth generation pilot quite a different character than a first gen pilot. There are several ways of structuring pilot's training, but from the point of view of the set of abilities, uh, we split the subject into administration, tactics, and performance under stress. Admin includes emergency procedures, starting the airplane, taxiing, takeoff, flying the weather, flying in bad weather, and so on. Tactics include employing the weapon system, shooting missiles, teamwork, threat knowledge, and so on. Performance under stress includes, uh, well, the ability of performing all of the above under stress. Brilliant definition, sir. Admin has been an important part of the previous generation training. Just getting to the point of being capable of flying the aircraft safely required a good helping of airmanship. Many, many years at the beginning of the pilot's career were dedicated to acquiring these capabilities that can be later sold to a civilian airline. And pilots have historically judged themselves by their airmanship, what they call the right stuff. Well, this approach is obsolete because the fifth generation has changed all of this. Of course, some um, airmanship is still required, but the F-35, for example, is considered a very, very easy aircraft to fly. Did you ever notice that there is no dual-seater variant? This is because the combination of advanced fifth gen simulators and ease of flight, well, do not require dual seater. For a native fifth gen pilot, airmanship is not that important because the aircraft is doing most of the stuff a pilot would be doing. And it leaves time for the other elements of the split. 
tactics. As we said before, the concept of wingman is dying. All the members of a two or four ship formation have more or less the same role. This means that a fifth generation pilot to be useful must have the capability of reading the tactical situation and take decision and solve problems that with the previous generations were basically in the hands of the formation leader. So the baseline for the fifth generation in terms of tactical proficiency is much higher than it used to be. In fact, training must be focused on complex tactics and as described before, it requires the involvement of several different elements to be effective. Fifth gen simulators are essential for all of this because they can simulate these complex situations that involve different aircraft and the way they interact. But they are hardly discussed. The flip side of the coin though is that now you have another essential element of the logistic chain that is expensive, complex, but it must be available because it's necessary for training, refreshes and so on. Hey, this is another element of the fifth generation cost and complexity, but well, that's beyond the scope of the video. Anyway, despite the importance of simulators, nothing can fully replace real flight training in a structured environment like the flag exercise because the fifth generation aircraft is, well, basically built to work in that environment. In a near peer confrontation, this is the way US and NATO do expect to fight. That is what pilots need to be trained for. So a full ship training mission like the one that is going to be organized by the average squadron will be obviously important but of limited use because several of the capabilities of the aircraft, well, will not be tested. And the flip side obviously is that flag exercises are few and far between. An American pilot will likely be involved in a red flag or equivalent once or twice in its career at most, but a pilot from the US allies will likely never have the opportunity to be part of it. However, there is a silver lining, at least for the US, because even outside flag exercises, it is much easier for the US to organize complex training, but for a small air force with one or two squadrons, it's basically an unsurmountable challenge uh, outside of a coalition. Actually, piling up flight hours does not tell the full story. Something that's a little known, for example, is that the Italian Air Force pilots fly on average about 3 to 5% more than the US pilots, but the quality of each American training mission is way higher because, well, the US can assemble these more complex environments even outside of a flag training exercise. And please consider that the Aeronautica Militare and then the Italian industry have traditionally invested heavily on training and there is no shortage of training infrastructure in Italy which is well ahead of other major European air forces. And in fact, many European and extra-European countries use Italian training facilities, uh, particularly in the context of the Eurofighter force, but also in general for various parts of the training syllabus. The same complex exercises that we have just described are the environment where the pilot's capability to act under stress is developed. It is a capability that can be trained in environments that are stressing just enough to be a good exercise, but not as much as to overwhelm the learner. The fifth generation pilot must, the fifth generation pilot must in fact cope with the additional stress of having to take autonomous decisions that a traditional wingman must not take. The picture that emerges is that fifth generation pilot training is different and once again more complex than ever before. Not to mention the fact that all this discussion is assuming that the opponent does not deploy his fifth generation assets in any meaningful amount. But this is changing too. In fact, Russia and China do have their own fifth generation doctrine. I'm sure that many of you won't believe me, but they do have it and it is well developed. But this will be the subject of the next video in this series. So thank you very much for getting so far in the video. I consider a privilege and a honor having had your time. If you like the video, please do the usual YouTube stuff, like, subscribe and hit the bell so you will be notified when a new video is published. An enormous thank you to all those who are supporting the channel on Patreon by being a member or by one of donations through different channels. You are absolute stars. 
you are essential for this operation and for those who are not supporting the channel if you could consider becoming a supporter in the way that is most suited to you this will greatly help for what is coming in the future so this is it thank you very much for watching and see you next time Thank you.